The concept of vertical takeoff is not new. The helicopter has been around for decades. But the idea of creating a fixed wing aircraft that could take off vertically taxed the minds of designers for a long time. In the mid-50s, Rolls-Royce built a test rig nicknamed the Flying Bedstead. By 1958, this had been converted into a realistic aircraft, the short SC-1. It had no less than five Rolls-Royce RB-108 engines, four of them mounted vertically to give it lift, and one mounted in the tail to push it into forward flight. However, the secret of vertical takeoff was the brainchild of Sir Stanley Hooker and his team from Bristol Aero Engines. They built an engine based on the idea of a Frenchman, Michel Vibo, that could raise an aircraft vertically by vectoring thrust through four nozzles pointing to the ground. By swiveling those nozzles backwards, it was possible to convert vertical flight into forward flight. Sir Sidney Cam, chief designer at Hawkers, now directed his team to design an airframe for a single-engine vertical takeoff fighter. This was to become the P-1127. This strange-looking beast had a conventional cockpit with a nozzle control for the engine exhausts, high wings, and a bicycle undercarriage instead of the normal tricycle arrangement. On the 21st of October 1960, Hawker's chief test pilot, Bill Bedford, managed to get into a tethered hover, even though the engine had barely enough poke to provide both lift and the power for the reaction control system. Those are the puffers at the extremities of the aircraft to keep it stable. Within one month, Bill Bedford had mastered the art of hovering with Stanley Hooker's Pegasus engine. On the 12th of September 1961, V-Stoll became a reality when the aircraft transitioned from the hover to conventional flight and back again. done it, we realized then that we had made the important step forward and proved the basic concept, although there was a very large amount of development work that had to be done to refine it for operational use. The aircraft had been designed both for research and for operational use. It had the strength to last 3,000 hours of punishing short takeoffs, flights and landings. Could also take off from grass, unlike any other jet fighters of the time. And this was one of the keys to the aircraft's future success. The constant limitations of constructed hard runways had restricted previous aircraft and made undamaged aircraft unavailable because of destroyed airfields. It was a historic moment in 1963 when Bill Bedford landed the P-1127 on HMS Ark Royal. Twenty-five years later, he recalled that moment. Yeah, it's fairly relaxed from my point of view. Lots of comments made about uh, you'll buckle the deck, you'll deafen the captain, and you'll blow the crew overboard. But nothing dramatic like that. But the Navy was not impressed. The aircraft could not carry enough stores and armaments, and it only had limited range. By 1963, the aircraft was fully enough developed to be shown at the Paris Air Show. Bill Bedford began the display by showing off the P-1127 at its very best. I completed my decelerating transition, was in the middle of a uh, pirouette, when suddenly the bottom fell out of my lift and I felt myself plummeting earthwards and ignominiously I crashed in front of the president's tent on the concrete platform with a progressive disintegration of the undercarriage and
very expensive noises taking place. In 1964, the aircraft finally got a name, the Kestrel, named after the hovering bird of prey. Nine Kestrels were built to equip a tripartite evaluation squadron. The RAF, the Luftwaffe, and the United States Army, Navy, and Air Force all allotted pilots to this American-backed NATO program. This aircraft had a number of improvements over the original prototype. Truly swept wings, a drooping tail, and puffers that had been developed to blow air both up and down gave it more manoeuvrability. In nine months, more than 900 sorties put the Kestrel well ahead of any competition. Just like the Navy, the RAF had reservations about the aircraft. They wanted a supersonic fighter. But the supersonic development of the Kestrel, the P-1154, was cancelled by the government in 1964. What the RAF finally got was a Kestrel that had more power, an inertial navigation and weapons system, and a head-up display for the pilot. It was called the Harrier. 77 ground attack and reconnaissance versions, GR-1s, were ordered by the RAF. They entered service with number one squadron in 1969. One of the pilots who found himself flying this new machine was the then Air Commodore Paddy Hine. It was a real handful to operate. And of course you had the added dimension of the VSTOL flight regime. And I had never really flown helicopters apart from a two weeks induction course. And there's something slightly unnatural about bringing a high performance combat fighter down below its normal stalling speed. In RAF Germany, the Harrier's mission was close air support for the Army. Numbers 3, 4 and 20 squadrons were the first line of defence in the event of a Soviet assault from East Germany. In many ways, I would say that the Harrier was the most interesting aircraft that I've operated in the RAF because of the off main base deployment option. And we in Germany at that time, this was 1974-75, were much involved in developing that concept. And we could use stretches of road that might be in forests or on the outskirts of villages. We could use the villages in which to hide aircraft. Many of our war sites at that time uh, were in villages themselves. So developing that concept was, was pioneering stuff. Because of its ability to attack and then hide near the front line, the Harrier was used for many sorties each day, either in its attack role or on photographic reconnaissance. It was ironic that the one arm of the US military not represented in the tripartite squadron had been the Marines. They needed a high-performance fixed-wing V-style aircraft, and in the Harrier they found one. They continued with the Aden guns that had proved so successful in Europe, but they were the first to equip their Harriers, which they called AV-8As, with AIM-9E Sidewinder missiles. That gave the aircraft an air-to-air -air combat role for the first time. Some of the pilots were a little apprehensive. The difference between uh, conventional flight and the transition phase into V-stall or vertical and short takeoff and landing, that transition there is probably the most difficult thing to learn. But it's like anything else. It's like learning to walk. Once you learn how, it's easy. Another first for the U.S. Marines was operating the AV-8A from assault ships. This meant that it was being pushed to its full potential. The essence of Harrier operation in Europe was quick turnaround. Even the 18 Matra Sneb rockets per pod, which could be fired singly or in a ripple or all at once, could be loaded very quickly. The Snebs were one link between the GR1 and its successor, the GR3. The same airframe was used, but now the aircraft had a new nose with a laser rangefinder and target seeker. There were new radar-seeking aerials on the tail, and there was an uprated Pegasus II engine with 21,500 pounds of thrust, and also the Ferranti FE-541 inertial navigation and attack system.
Although the Royal Navy was still resisting the Harrier, political cutbacks meant that their carrier fleet was getting smaller. Hawker Siddeley dispatched their demonstrator aircraft, G. VTOL, to HMS Blake in 1970 to have another go at convincing the Admiralty. But a lack of deck space meant that it had to take off and land vertically, and that used a lot of power and therefore restricted its payload. What the Navy needed was a deck that could allow the Harrier a short takeoff and vertical landing. In 1973, a keen skier, Lieutenant Commander Doug Taylor, came up with a staggeringly simple invention. A curved ramp at the end of the flat flight deck did away with the complicated paraphernalia of steam catapult, deck cables and arrestor wires. In August 1977, the first trial ski jump was tried out at the Royal Aircraft Establishment at Bedford. It was found that the Harrier only needed half of its rolling takeoff speed and a third of the deck roll, compared to a takeoff from the flat deck. For the new generation of carriers, only the Harrier would do. They were made for each other. On April the 2nd, 1982, Argentina invaded the Falkland Islands in the South Atlantic. Britain's response was to assemble a task force of some 40 ships, including the aircraft carriers Invincible and Hermes. The Falklands are 8,000 miles from Britain and thousands of miles from the nearest airfield. Therefore, the only aircraft that could be used for air defence of the fleet were the Harriers. The fleet air arm FRS-1C Harriers were joined by the GR-3 fighter bombers of number one squadron RAF. They were based on HMS Hermes. Uh, and we were going down there in an air defence role initially, but we couldn't carry missiles. So a number of modifications uh, which had to be done to the programme in pretty short order. Um, having got down there, then there are obviously limitations of the aircraft which were known before, but the conflict confirmed. Uh, short range, limited payload not a particularly effective nav system and a very limited self-defense system and indeed we lost aircraft down there to ground fire. In the dogfights that followed a trick learnt from the Americans called viffing, victoring in forward flight, fooled many Argentine pilots when the Harriers seemed to stop in mid-air. On May the 1st a Sea Harrier flown by an exchange RAF pilot, Flight Lieutenant Paul Barton, downed an Argentine Mirage with a sidewinder. The Harrier was at war and it was to destroy more than 20 enemy jets. I think when we came home from the conflict, number one, uh, we've now learned how to operate with the Navy. Let's continue to try to do it, um, maybe on an annual basis. And indeed we succeeded in doing that until the end of the GR3 era. We're about to start again now with the GR7. We confirm the need for an electronic warfare system uh, and ideally a fully automated one, integral to the aircraft, and that's what we've got in the GR-7. And I think that carried across from the lessons there. We learned the need for self-defense missiles and indeed a late modification for the GR-7 put two missiles on it, again as a direct result of our involvement in that conflict. Despite the success of the Falklands campaign, the RAF decided they needed a bigger Harrier. The GR-5, this time built by McDonnell Douglas and British Aerospace, was test flown at Boscombe Down in 1985. Ten years earlier, the British government had withdrawn all further funding for Harrier development. So McDonnell Douglas joined forces with the US Marines to build the AV-8B, with a bigger carbon fibre wing and a modern raised cockpit based on that of the F-15.
The RAF flew their first sortie in the new GR-5 in March 1988. The addition of a refuelling probe meant that it had a much increased range, so it could attack targets deep into enemy territory. Also, bigger flaps meant an increased bomb load. But in 1989, the breakup of the Soviet Union meant that NATO's role changed completely. Suddenly, its main enemy was seeking peace. The British government seized the opportunity to cut the RAF's budget drastically. A document called Options for Change was presented in Parliament on the 25th of July, 1990. Just one week later, Iraq invaded Kuwait. Amongst the vast coalition air force assembled in the Middle East were AV-8Bs for close air support. The overall effect of the air campaign completely neutralized the Iraqi Air Force. Iraq's surrender was swift, but its airspace would have to be constantly patrolled well after the conflict was over. That was one of Harrier's roles in Operation Warden, keeping the peace. With the breakup of the Soviet Union came the loosening of the grip of communism on Eastern Europe. One country to feel the worst effects of this was Yugoslavia. Festering, suppressed racialism between Serbs and Croats, Muslim and Christian, broke out into full-scale war by 1993. In an effort to restrict the aggressive Serbs, the United Nations instigated Operation Deny Flight. It banned all fixed and rotary wing aircraft from flying over Bosnian territory. At the centre of this operation were the Harriers of HMS Ark Royal patrolling the Adriatic Sea. Here we are, poised in international waters. Uh, we're beholden to no one. We are, in fact, a go-anywhere airfield. So it doesn't matter where the wind comes from or if fog comes and uh, prevents them flying from the shore, then we still have the ability to do that from the sea. RAF Harrier GR-7s, the latest version of the aircraft, equipped with FLIR infrared system for night fighting, were deployed to bases in southern Italy they agreed with the Navy as to the role they were taking. No, we don't actually want to be dropping the bombs. It's a threat of dropping the bombs, I think, when it's about uh, the flexibility. You know, we get airborne, and you can tell us to get anywhere in the theatre, and we can go there. We've got the fuel, we've got the range, we've got the bombs that we carry. And again, it's, you know, Carrying the big stick, if you like, the threat. You know, we all hear about drawing the lines in the sand, but we're part of that. I mean, we are that line. You know, you step beyond it, the guys on the ground then can call upon us you know, to give them some help. In 1995, the Serbs continued to ignore all UN warnings. So, NATO was ordered to begin air strikes against them. This was the start of Operation Deliberate Force. This forced the Bosnian Serbs to the negotiating table and it brought a tentative peace to Bosnia. In the years since the Harrier first amazed the world with its ingenuity, no less than seven military air arms have used the Harrier. 
Its roles have been many and varied, and it's excelled at all of them. But what of the future? In June 1997, an RAF exercise was directed by the commander of the Harrier Force, Group Captain Clive Loder. His base was a disused airfield in Norfolk. I'm not sure if we're going to learn anything new, except to say that we need to practice uh, the type of operation that we've seen over Bosnia and Iraq. They don't just happen. You can't just go to theatre and expect on day one to get those things right. They are complicated uh, processes, both in the planning and in the, uh, the coordination and the execution of, uh, of those uh, sorties. And it's very important for NATO that it uh, is able to practice these in the appropriate scenario so that it has a high confidence level that when you go on operations, when after all, on day one, people may well be firing things at you, service to air and air to air, that you've already got your game plan worked out, you're professional, and the losses will be absolutely minimized. Since the demise of the Cold War, we've We've revamped, re revamped the Harrier Force concept of operations uh, and the government requires us to be able to operate from a spectrum of locations, from a fully found, fully hardened NATO type base right down through a civil military airfield to a, an austere location where we have to go and take everything that we need, all the consumables of war and indeed all of the other admin support of people who are going to support the aircraft's operation. All of that has to be brought into a bare base airfield and that is exactly what we're practicing here at Skullthorpe and yes it is uh, very um, typical of what we could be asked to do. Well, the 7's been in service for about five years now and we've already made uh, great progress with its uh, introduction to service and indeed it's been blooded in operations over Bosnia and Iraq already. Um, a number of improvements have gone into the aircraft. As you look forward, it's, ideally it's going to see us through to somewhere around 2015. In spite of an initial lack of faith, the Harrier has become indispensable to NATO in an ever-changing world. It is still the only operational V-Stol fighter in the West and it is likely to be developed even further. The Harrier will continue to be a force to be reckoned with into the 21st century.